<laughs> you know, this other stuff. Okay. <laughs> Woohoo! Yay! Woo All right, I'm just gonna check my Facebook on my phone to make sure we're we're going here. Working with our technology the best we can. Awesome. Okay. Thank you everyone for joining us today. I'm here with Shara Sievers. Yay. This works. Sometimes technology works, sometimes it doesn't, but it's working for us now. So thank you everyone for being with us. And today we're celebrating Earth Day together. And we're going to talk about some really beautiful topics that will uplift us as a community. And so I'm talking with Shara and with you guys. I want you guys to ask your questions, be part of the discussion, be part of the conversation. These are really powerful times that we're in right now. And we have an opportunity to create massive shift on the planet and really honor the planet for who she is on this special Earth Day. So we're going to start off with Shara speaking a little bit about sacred activism. And maybe she can tell us a little bit about how that relates to Earth Day. Yeah, absolutely. Hello, everyone, and happy Earth Day. And it's an honor to be here. Um, I love the topic that uh, Susie and I decided upon for this day. And uh, I wanted to share uh, my, my definition and how I stand in the world and how I think we can all stand in the world uh, using the frame of uh, sacred or sometimes called spiritual activism, but I'm going to keep it as sacred activism. It was actually a term uh, created by a social anthropologist, philosopher, psychologist, social architect, uh, thought leader, thinker, Andrew Harvey, who is uh, one of my ment many mentors. And the most common question that also that often comes up is, well, what's the difference between activism? and sacred activism. And I think the main, so we, we all know what activism is. It's something that we stand for, that we think needs to change in our social, ecological environment or community. And it's usually a reflection of our values. The difference between uh, sacred activism and just activism is that it's something that you have embodied in your daily life and in your personal practices. Um, so it goes deeper than let's change this amendment or let's add this amendment or uh, things of that nature. It's something that you have experienced internally, you've embodied, if you will, um, as an interconnectedness yeah. with all of life so other beings uh your neighbors those in your community your state country and world um all living species plants animals uh our earth creatures sea creatures bird creatures so um that that interconnectedness and once you plug into that interconnectedness what happens when sacred activism is activated is that one begins to feel a personal responsibility, a true passion that is pulling you um, to make a difference. And I, 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 think that's, I think that's where I'll leave it for now. So one of the discussions I've been having with people is this idea of moving into neutrality or zero point energy. And where does it fit in to take a stand? If you're, if you're neutral, where is there the opportunity to take a sacred stand for something? Sure. Tell me a little bit more how you are framing um, zero point neutrality. Well, it just means like instead of being triggered about something that you read or, or an interaction you have with someone, instead of there being a trigger, you're just observing. Right. And you're not reacting. Sure. Great. Thank you. So how does sacred activism fit into zero, uh, zero point neutrality? So I think, again, that goes back to our mastery and our, our, our personal mastery. So when we understand that we're the interconnectedness of all things, it's and if we're staying present with that interconnectedness, that presence 
um, allows for a heart expansion so that rather than triggering or reacting, um, we're able to approach a conversation, for example, um, a belief or a value uh, in a sense with a sense of curiosity. Uh, and I think, I think that's a really good way to approach it. Uh, another word on triggers is just, if, if we're triggered, that's something for us to also look at because it's, a growth, it's always a growth opportunity and an awareness opportunity. Um, for me, all triggers lead to the opportunity for uh, heart expansion. Yeah, and I'll add to that, uh, when we are able to get into that place of the observer role, the neutrality, it's from that place actually that our most powerful creations, our most powerful decision-making can come from. Because if we're making decisions out of reactivity, then it's not a sacred stand. It's, <laughs> you know, we're taking a stand based on re our reactions to something. Absolutely. Yeah, beautiful. Let's talk about community resiliency because Cher, I know this is something you've studied a lot. You've um, created a model around this and I'd love to hear about community resiliency and how we can apply it right now. Um, Absolutely. You know, the, the coronavirus yeah, and everything that's been happening, you know, we may not be able to come together in physicality, but there are still ways we can come together as community. Beautiful, I love it. It's, it's my favorite topic right now. It's something yeah. I'm very passionate <laughs> about. Um, again, just to, to help uh, the audience, I, I'd like to give my definition of community resiliency and how it's evolved and where it's evolved from. Um, the idea of community resiliency is not a new idea. Uh, it's been around in one form or another uh, for at least 30 or 40 years, actually very close, uh, the, the, the era of the first Earth Day. This is the 50th anniversary of Earth Day. Um, resiliency, the community resiliency originally was designed, well, how does a community respond um, to adversity uh, in a systemic um, and prompt way uh, that is effective. So rather than chaos management, there's, there's been a system. That is in place in many communities. We call that emergency response, and it's typically uh, um, managed, if you will, by a, a city or state authorities or organizations. I've taken community resiliency a, a little bit deeper, if you will, and have expanded the model. Um, and I will address how we can use what community resiliency, how we can use that in this era of um, pandemics. Pandemics. So um, community resiliency starts in the neighborhood and it starts uh, with the relationships that we develop in our neighborhood. I call that social wellness. Um, it means no one's left behind, that we know our neighbors. We know those who are li living alone. We know the elders. Uh, we know the youth. And each of them has a role in the health, in the health and wealth um, of our community, of our neighborhood. Yeah. Uh, I've mentioned the, the, the youth leadership is really important in community resiliency. We want to give our youth a voice ASAP. Uh, we want to be sure that our elders uh, are taken care of and that we're also tapping into their wisdom and giving them a role in our communities. Um, we you, get to activism as well. Do you see that happening right now? Do you see that happening in Sedona and, you know? Okay, I see it happening in a number of different areas that have, um, thank you for asking, that have experienced um, some kind of adversity, be it a fire or earthquake or hurricane, a, a, you know, a natural disaster, and that have had systems set up in the way of town halls, for example, or are part of what's called transition towns. I see it happening in the Sedona and, Ver and Verde Valley area, uh, not specifically in neighborhoods, but amongst networks and webs of people that have known each other for a while. 
Mm -hmm. um, so it's not specifically geographic as it is more of a social web uh, or a social network. What I'm proposing is that it be done geographically. Um, perfect example now is COVID. We're not, we're not moving about. So perhaps our social web or our social network, um, these friends um, or our, our intimate community, we could be 20 to 40 miles away from them, for example. Um, so starting in the neighborhood is, is actually what I propose. Uh, there's other elements of, of uh, community resiliency, having sovereignty over our food and water. So community gardens are a huge part of that. Um, um, I just want to go back real quick to what you're saying sure. about the neighborhoods. Um, one thing that people can do right now is check on your neighbors. And you know, you've probably already done this, but if you haven't, check on your neighbors, see, if, see how they're doing, do they need anything, is there anything that they have that you can exchange with them, if they need something and exactly. you need something. Uh, like, let's make this nitty gritty practical. What right. we can do right now, check in on your neighbors, see how everyone's doing. And I think that's happening thanks to next door. Um, we have in the Sedona and Verde Valley areas um, with the different next doors uh, because it's based on zip code and area. We do, we have that established. Um, actually, talking a phone about system. the computer app or the phone app. Yeah, no, I'm talking about the, the computer app, the phone app. It's yeah. called nextdoor.com. I'm just assuming everybody knows about it. Sorry. <laughs> but it is a very good tool to use in the time of COVID to get to know your neighbors, to check in on your neighbors. We've developed a, a buddy system where you're actually calling and checking in, particularly on those that are alone. Um, because uh, being in a shelter in place or quarantine, however you want to frame that, uh, can be very, very uh, difficult for those that are alone. Um, so that's been something that's been happening in the different areas using Nextdoor as a primary tool. Awesome. Yeah, and even getting your neighbor's phone numbers. Like some people yeah. don't know their neighbors. Some people know their neighbors and say hi, but they're acquaintances. Like get get their contact information, get their phone numbers. I was asking my neighbor, he's elderly. I was like, give me your medical information just in case, you know. Um, these little things just to, to reach out and to create connection. These are things we can all do. That's beautiful. And that's exactly what... Um, in this era, that's what we've been uh, proposing. And it was actually a request, you know, it was coming out like, I'm, I'm afraid, I'm alone, yeah. um, I'm elderly, I can't, I can't run errands. So that is happening in our area. And I, I, you know, I haven't done a national survey because I'm very focused on uh, localizing, which is also yeah. part of community resiliency. Yeah. Um, supporting our local businesses and commerce and, um, I think I've mentioned, yeah, the, the, the youth leadership and also affordable housing and just other local um, concerns. So that's that, yeah, that beautiful. part of community. We're resilience. starting to move into uh, the Go topic of, of gardening before I interrupt. Oh, you. okay, great. What is it that you'd like to know <laughs> about gardening? Um, yeah, well, what what can we do? Like, I know you had an initiative working on getting community gardens set up. Right, and it's been a little challenging, I have to say, and I uh, people have shared with me why, and uh, our particular community um, is, is transient. And there is a core community, obviously, that's, you know, been around for, it's the core of the community, 20, 30 years, but there, there's a lot of transients. The, temporary, come for a year or two. Mm -hmm. um, there's also an elder demographic in the, the Sedona, the OC, Verde Valley areas. So it's been a little challenging, but we have identified, we've got a core team committed. We've identified two to three different locations that can definitely be used for community garden. Uh, one of them will be raised bed. One of them is actually already in, de in development. And another is um, uh, going to be designed more as an intentional community. The okay. growing season in our area is a little different too. So with the, this probably won't get off the ground till the fall with actual food. Um, 
because we're moving into the summer where it's a bit too hot, but we are getting the locations. Um, I awesome. think Y food, uh, it's, it's probably one of the most ancient ceremonies um, that we as a species have shared really since time, uh, since the beginning of time to, to grow food and more so to gather in the sacred ritual uh, of sharing food. Yeah, uh, for sure. Yeah, and I think the I think a lot of decisions that we make for our communities can and need to be made around that table where we're sharing our food. Yeah, that's perfect. The idea of round tables and everyone has a voice and bringing together the elders and the younger and everyone in between uh, to honor everyone's voice, I think is really powerful. Uh, I just want to say anyone who is uh, with us either on the Zoom or on the Facebook Live. If you live in or around Sedona and you want to be part of the community gardens or you have ideas, uh, put that in the chat. Let us know in the comments who you are and what you have to share or contribute. Um, I also have a Facebook group for those who live in Sedona called the Sedona Gardening Co-op. Oh. So you can join that and it's the whole idea there is to come together share our resources and our knowledge, share food if we have an abundance of, of something. Uh, it's, a beautiful, it's a beautiful way to build community uh, online also. That's beautiful. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Um, just wanted to sit, add something else. As the community garden project gets going and also with your group, uh, seed exchange and heirloom, uh, heirloom organic seed exchange is actually a part of that movement too so that we have for sure that we have organic healthy food yeah beautiful yeah and we can that's part of the co-op too like uh, the Facebook group I mentioned if you want to share your seeds or if you need a certain type of seed go in and ask for it you know yeah. and offer what you have there's lots of opportunity to do that in this area I believe I wanted to add one more thing, Susie, just because sure. you were asking about this time, like what can we do in community resiliency. I also think that this is an, uh, a great opportunity for each of us uh, to step into our, our personal mastery and our personal leadership roles. And this ties back into to the uh, idea or definition of uh, sacred activism. And that being, that question being, um, how can I serve? Where can I serve? Um, how can I be the best version of myself in these times? So that, I think this is a huge opportunity for all of us to really do that, that deep dive. Um, I know it's more challenging for those that uh, are forced to not only work at home, but also to do homeschooling with their children. But even taking a moment when we're all eating together with our family to ask each other that in this very challenging time, like, what are we learning from this? What are we learning about our personal leadership uh, abilities and practices? Um, it goes back to, to what you said before, that personal mastery, personal leadership is how do I stay in that zero point of neutrality? So that is mastery. Yeah, uh, it's that takes a lot of inner work. <laughs> right, it's emotional intelligence. Yeah, and, and I want to say too, leadership is not always standing up on a stage and, you know, delivering a speech or being a mayor or a president of your community. Leadership can be, you know, you've been doing your inner work for 20 years in the quiet of your own home. You have wisdom to share. Get out and share it somehow. Share it with a friend, share it on a Facebook Live, you know, show up and share what you've gleaned and what you know. Leadership can be quiet. Maybe you're a mom at home with your kids. No one's going to like see you being a leader necessarily, but you still are a leader. And that leadership role that you play with your family is very important. So I, I want to invite people to really own the, the leadership skills that they have. And I want to invite people to own the leadership roles that they play because a lot of times we play leadership roles and we don't even realize that we're doing that or we don't acknowledge and value uh, how much worth we're bringing to these roles that we're playing. 
Yeah, that's such a beautiful point that no one has to tell us to, to be a leader yeah. or that we're, we are leaders. Leaders are, are individuals that, again, show up with a vision. They show up who they are, and it can be, it can be any level of contribution. Uh, the most important thing is that you have self-mastery. Um, because when you show up with self-mastery, you're showing up authentically, you're showing up uh, in an integrated way, uh, and that automatically is going to be um, an opportunity and an invitation for trust and connection. Uh, so, Yeah, no, that's perfect, because if you're showing up and you're just speaking a lot of words, people can see through it. But if you're showing up in alignment with yourself, and you're grounded and, and you're embodying what you're saying, it has a whole different level of impact. So that self-mastery piece is really important if we want to create change, if we want to uh, show up as leaders and, and be leaders. I, and then, um, Jim, maybe you can also post this on Facebook so people can see this. Uh, Jim Reich is, is starting a community garden at his space, the Sedona Oasis, uh, that's in Cornville. So um, I would encourage you, Jim, and invite you, if you would please post that also on the Facebook thread underneath this, uh, this live, because that way anyone local will be able to see. Yeah, what, fantastic. Yeah, what um, you're up to. And, yeah, and, and I've been in conversation with Jim a little bit too. Do you mind if I share a really brief little personal story that how this has just uh, e evolved and emerged for me just in the yeah, last please. few months? Yeah. Um, because it's very tied in with love and leadership and in, in the topics that we're discussing. Um, when, when all of this news came and, and we've got a, a spread of a virus and, uh, and all the different theories around it, um, I found myself, I had a choice. I had a choice to stay small or play small, become a victim, complain, or I had an opportunity to say, okay, no, this is, this is a time now to really stand up, introduce myself in a new community and say, hey, let's, let's do this. So I'm feeling very um, integrated and authentic uh, as a result of, of a global pandemic that we're, we all are a part of, whether we, depends on, doesn't matter what depth our belief system is, it is affecting all of us. Um, so I just want to encourage everybody that you know the best version of yourself. You really do. You have a vision. You have a dream. I'm sure it has and it can have an impact and a contribution in your community, with your family, in your workplace. Um, and this is really the time uh, to offer that. Uh, I think all of us are, are hungry for connection. We're, we're hungry to uh, connect and relate authentically, both, both in person and online. Because again, with, the, with what's going on, as you've said, Susie, like, what do we do? We're, we're locked in our homes or we're, we're sheltered in our homes. Like, how are we connecting online beautiful and i would like to take that conversation into uh to talk about nonviolent communication on social media uh, because you know this what's been happening is bringing out the best in people and it's bringing out the worst in people and facebook has become a place where i'm just seeing so much fighting and separation and division and my heart is truly broken about that because i believe social media can be a place where we come together in unity and i believe that if if we're divided then we're never going to create the shift that we truly want we're never going to reach that heaven on earth that we've been working on creating together so i really believe we need to put our differences aside and celebrate our differences even but still come together and work together and on social media it's so easy to spew something out and not take accountability for what the energy you've just projected out there because you're not standing directly in front of the person 
So no one's going to reach through the screen and slap you or, <laughs> you know, we don't have that immediate uh, responsibility or feedback when we're posting on Facebook or other social media. And so uh, I wanted to have Shara talk about nonviolent communication because this is something that you've studied and you really worked a lot with. So what are your yes, thoughts about communicating nonviolently on social media? It's, uh, yeah, it's been a new endeavor for me. And again, it's another opportunity of stepping into, um, you know, an integrated role where my intention is to have a positive impact. So just for those that, uh, I don't know how many are listening, but just to real briefly, nonviolent communication is a system that was created by Marshall Rosenberg. Um, who passed over, I think about four or five years ago, definitely one of my mentors. Um, the system very, very uh, fundamentally is based on two things, knowing your needs and understanding the emotions that come from needs unmet and needs that are met. So if we're in touch with a need, uh, needs can be need for connection, need for belonging, need for recognition, need for love, need for contribution. Uh, there's, he's got maybe 30 or 40 needs and you can, NBC, I think it's uh, Nonviolent Communication Academy. It, we'll find that be really great if we could post the, um, uh, the, the URL for that because just understanding your, what your needs are will be a huge indicator of how you're community and why you're communicating. So when I notice the social media, when it gets into a, t I, I am, have been blown away actually, what I've just seen on Sedona, different bulletin boards. Um, <laughs> I haven't monitored bulletin boards all over the country, but I'm also on pretty active on a number of other bulletin boards. I've been, you know, social, involved with social media for actually 12 years, but, um, I've, I've been blown away. There's name calling, there's attacking, there's what is labeled as what I call passive aggressive behavior. Passive aggressive behavior is a clear indicator that a need is not being met. In this particular time, many of us are not having our needs met. Um, we're, we're being forced to do things that we don't want to do. We, that's our need for autonomy. Uh, we're not being heard, we're not in interaction. But I just want to encourage everybody on social media, before you go ahead and respond to a post that you are in disagreement with, if you can just pause, find your presence, find your heart space, and ask yourself, what is the intention of this person? Or what need is not being met? In this person if we could just take a moment to do that before responding we might not even reply or if we want to engage in a conversation if this is an important topic for you if we want to engage in the conversation I would say start your post or your response to a post with a question um, or a statement that ex uh, demonstrates curiosity I'm wondering if or thank you for sharing. Do you feel just something that creates connection? How successful you'll be, we will see, because very few people, not everybody's trained in nonviolent or conscious communication. But having an understanding um, rather than engaging in the name calling and the attacking and the right and wrong, um, that is not helping any of us. It's creating a lot more division. So, yeah, yeah I, I, I'm looking at putting together a, a quick webinar uh, and probably and, and posting it on uh, broadcasting it on May 4th, just like five simple tips uh, for how to engage in social media in um, in a conscious way. Awesome. And you'll put uh, after we're done with this, Sherry, you'll put a link in the Facebook comments so people know how to sign up for that webinar. How to yeah, exactly. Perfect. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah, thank you so much for that, Shara. Uh, it is just, it is, it is such an opportunity that we have right now to connect online, to create and cultivate deeper connection. I really do believe we can use social media in these ways and for these purposes. And I've always 
I've always been very tolerant on my personal profile in the sense that, you know, I see a lot of, if you believe this, block me now, unfriend me now, you know? Yeah. And for me, uh, I want to have diversity on my Facebook profile. I want to learn from other people. I want to grow. Maybe I even want to be triggered sometimes so I can see where I need to heal and grow. And so I invite people, share, you know, your perspectives, but also be respectful. Uh, like the name calling that you referenced, Shara, I just... Why? Why do we need to do that? Why can't we just come with curiosity about someone else's perspective and point of view and, and receive each other and connect? And um, it's, it's interesting to me because, you know, I don't want to have to police my posts and my threads and comments and all of that. Uh, but sometimes it feels a little bit like, I'm a mother scolding people like, hey, you know, speak kindly to each other. <laughs> so I'm wondering, exactly. Shira, if you have any thoughts about that and how we can, you know, speak kindly to each other. Yeah, well, you know, if we look, if we go back to the purpose of social media, it was intended to create community. Um, and now that we have a lot of bulletin boards or groups, be they private or public, it really is the responsibility of the uh, group, or page administrator to set guidelines. And this is pretty standard in, in online community development that we set, a we set guidelines for uh, basic etiquette. So basic etiquette uh, typically is no name calling, no blaming, no shaming, no attacking. Um, and it really, it is the responsibility of an administrator to um, either flag a post or delete a person or call them out on it. So I, I think if we all return to the purpose of social media and if we are starting a page or a group, private or public, or a class, that we're really, really clear on the etiquette guidelines, the set of agreements that you are entering in this community, in this a web of relationships because that's what a, a social or an online community is. It's a web of relationships. So I'm actually challenging uh, the administrators to take, take their role um, a little more seriously, actually step into more of a leadership role and, and really lay out some clear guidelines. Mm -hmm. um, what can we do now? We can post announcements on the pages and posts that this is this is what we're requiring in these times in order that we can all move forward together, but not, not uh, get into duality and division and name calling is just, it's just unacceptable. That is violent behavior. That's violence, uh, according to Marshall Rosenberg and, and that communication model. We teach our children to not call names. We as adults um, don't, we're, we don't want to engage in that kind of violent behavior that's not creating connection. Yeah, uh, for sure. I, I second that uh, call to administrators. And, you know, I wish Facebook, if you hear this, uh, allow us to do that on our profiles as well. I wish I could pin a post that says, if you want to have conversations here with my community, speak respectfully and kindly to each other, mm -hmm. you know? That's all I ask, yeah. <laughs> but, but I can't, you know, there's no function like that for a profile on Facebook. Not a personal profile, but on your pages, you can have announcements and pin posts and also on groups, uh, both public and private. And some of those features are fairly new. Uh, the announcement feature particularly can now show up at the top of your page and it's work. You know, it's work to be an administrator. It's uh, of, a, of an online community. It's a responsibility. It also takes, personal mastery, personal leadership to take a pause before you react and you respond and tap into your own self. Like what need of mine is not being met before I go ahead and respond to a person in any way that is not kind and respectful. We can disagree in a very kind yes. and respectful way. Yeah, so you mentioned two things that I'm just going to re-highlight. You, sure. you said when you, when you respond to a post or a comment, tune in to that other person, what need is not being met in what they've said and how you can respond to that. And then also tune into your own self and ask what need of mine is not being met 
and but then before you comment or post mm -hmm. yeah what's my intention about those things yeah you know i read a beautiful quote just uh, i was listening to a panel actually on sacred activism from a conference that i had attended a few years ago and they're again they're mentors of mine and peers charles eisenstein being one of them but one one piece that came out that was so beautiful is that the our the condition of truth right our authenticity is when we let the suffering speak so we all have pain we all have suffering as human beings it's it's part of the human condition just like we all have joy and happiness and um but learning how to share our suffering in a way that, again, is not passive aggressive, that's, that's transparent. It's like, hey, people, I'm hurting. Hey, people, I'm confused about this. Or I'm feeling angry about this. But owning it and claiming what's true for you, rather than hiding it and attacking someone else so that you're, you're it's, it's like a power struggle that, and a need to control that is not a healthy uh interaction yeah well said thanks well said. susie beautiful yeah so we are going to move into a, a time of short meditation together fantastic okay and, um, before we do that i just want to highlight again your webinar on may 4th about nonviolent communication and also this saturday i'm leading a class on getting out of confusion and overwhelm and moving into clarity. So if you have found yourself in this time being overwhelmed, being confused about what's going on, uh, this class is going to help you get clear and reconnected to your soul essence, to your own energy so that you can move forward with more clarity and confidence. And uh, just a few action steps from our conversation today, Cher, before we move into the meditation. Absolutely. Go for it. What can people do? Contact your neighbor, get their phone number, get their, uh, you know, getting the medical information may be crossing some boundaries or lines, depending on, on the person, depending on the type of relationship you have, obviously. Uh, but get information from each other that is helpful. Share your resources, uh, figure out what you have to give and what you need and what you want from your community and ask, reach out and ask for support, reach out and ask for help. Allow that vulnerability that you just mentioned, Shara, allow that vulnerability to be present in your conversations with your community and with your neighbors. So call your neighbors, reach out, check in on them, make sure they're okay, see what they need, see what you can give, see what uh, they can give you in exchange. Um, when you're posting on social media, you know, take that <laughs> sacred pause before totally. typing your response. What does the commenter need and what do I need? And tune into those things before reacting. Anything you want to add, Cheryl? Um, just keep asking yourself, what's the best version of me that I want to be? And just allow that to happen. Um, there, there's, um, you know, there's just one more thing. There's some of you may have heard of Ubuntu. Ubuntu is a, uh, it's a way that many cultures uh, around the world relate and connect with each other. And Ubuntu, the philosophy of Ubuntu is when somebody makes a mistake or does something that's, you know, not morally, morally in alignment with the um, the ethics and norms of a particular community or society we don't um, shun them or uh, ostracize them rather we gather in a circle and in, actually in these cultures we sing the song that they were born with because in tribal cultures oftentimes a song is sung when you're when you're born and but mainly it's to remind the person of who they are and that's what we're here to do in community. We're here to remind each other of our magnificence, our brilliance, our power, our uniqueness, our sameness, our gifts. And this is needed now uh, more than ever in, in communities. And I, I really do believe that none of us are free, free, free in our hearts, you know, free in our spirits. None of us are free until until all of us are free. And that 
you know, it, it's really community that's going to allow us to ascend. Yeah. I have, I have a little hashtag that I use sometimes, no soul left behind. I love that. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Fantastic. Beautiful. So all of you who are still with us, thank you for hanging out. And I'll just invite you to get into a meditative space. So if you want to lie down or if you want to uh, stay seated, just begin breathing deeply through your belly and allow that breath to ease your body and your mind. And ask yourself that question that Shara brought forth. Who do I want to become? What is the best version of myself? And just breathe with that question. What is the best version of myself? Again, keeping that breath deep within your belly, allowing it to circulate and move the energy throughout your body. What is the best version of myself? And allow yourself in this moment to come back to the knowing of who you are and the visions that you have. Allow yourself to dream again. As you breathe deeply, your body moves out of reactivity and back into balance and centeredness. And from that place of centeredness, you can reawaken your visions and dreams. So ask your heart and your soul, what is it that you truly desire? And set your intentions to allow your dreams and visions to reawaken. Breathe deeply. Use your exhales when you breathe out. Use that to release anything that's not yours to hold on to. Use your exhales to surrender any energy that's not yours. Maybe you've been carrying around the fear of the collective, the anxiety that's been in the ethers. Use your exhales to let that go. Blow it out of your field, of your body. And use your inhales to tap into more of who you are. What is the best version of me? Who do I want to be? Who am I now? What is the most powerful version of myself that I can realize now? What is the most powerful version of myself that I can realize now? Take a deep breath. Use your breath as your ally. Your breath changes your physiology depending on how you breathe. So breathe deeply through your belly. Allow your parasympathetic nervous system to be activated. Allow your mind to be calm and clear. Allow your body to be at peace. Your energy changes everything. Who do I want to be? What is the best version of myself? What do I truly desire? What do I truly desire for myself? For this planet? What do I truly desire for my community? 
What do I truly desire for human beings? If you have a desire of your heart, it's because you're meant to bring it forth. You're meant to realize that desire. So again, using your breath to move your desires out of your subconscious and into your conscious awareness. Pull your desires forth with your breath. Allow them to land and be rooted in your heart. Allow your desires to activate your conscious mind. We all want peace. We all want heaven on earth. We all want renewed society. Systems that work better. Systems that honor all beings. Let's find a way to get there together. And so as you feel your desires, I invite you to slowly come out of your meditative space. Find this live stream on Facebook and share with us your visions and desires. Share with us what you see in your mind's eye for society, for yourself. There's no such thing as being selfish. So share with us what you want. Mm. Thank you so, so much to all who joined with us today. Thank you, Shara, for your wisdom and expertise. It's a pleasure to be here. And um, that was such a beautiful meditation. And uh, I felt Gaia breathing as well, mm -hmm. as you were reminding us um, to be with our breath and to put our intentions and our desires for not only the best version of ourselves, but how we can make a contribution in this, this web of life that we're all part of. I, I really felt Gaia heard, heard mm -hmm. those words today. So mm -hmm. thank you so much. Beautiful. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Aho. Mm -hmm. uh -huh.